Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so you heard, I'm at the University of Maine. I am an archeologist and I do most of my work on the coast of Peru. I've been going there since 1978. How many years is that? 45, I think. Awesome. And I spent about a quarter of that time actually in Peru. My wife is from Peru. She's also a professor at the University of Maine. She teaches Spanish. So it's a place that has become very important in my life and I spent a lot of time studying. And you're gonna hear a lot about Peru today. This whole lecture is really about Peru, but it is also about climate. Because like so many things in, in my career, I got lucky and I stumbled upon some evidence very early on in 1980 that suggested a significant change in climatic conditions on the coast of Peru, well, we now think about 6,000 years ago, 5,800 years ago. And I started to study that, and that's been a, a productive direction of research over the years. I, I have been extremely lucky. I met a Norwegian explorer in a hotel line by accident once and ended up working with Tor Heyerdahl for many years. Um, did anybody go to his, he, 15, no, 20, 20, I'm sorry, 25 years ago, he gave a lecture in the main center for the arts. I don't know if anybody went to hear him, uh, but he did visit us several times, wonderful individual, uh, the Contiki guy. And because of running into him, then I ended up doing a bunch of other things, including going to Cuba, as you heard, and doing translating a book and doing some archeology span and having coffee with Fidel Castro, which was an amazing experience. Whatever you think about Fidel, he's an amazing, was an amazing individual. But anyway, because I got into this line, I've spent the last 45 years spending a lot of my research time working on issues of climate, particularly related to the phenomenon known as El Nino. Has anybody heard of El Nino before? Okay. Yeah, since 98 particularly, it's been very famous. There's actually a song. Sometimes I play it, but I didn't bring it with me today called Blame It on El Nino it's by Dr. Elmo, who you probably have not heard of, but it's a funny song from 1998. Oh, and we probably could blame a lot of things on, on El Nino. So why, why study El Nino? This is a picture from a relatively recent event in 2017. It can be very destructive in parts of the world, including the coast of Peru. It is, as you see here, a really important driver of what happens in climate everywhere. We're actually very fortunate in the Northeast, because in El Nino years, we usually have warmer winters. And of course we save on um, our heating, which is a good thing for us, but many places are not favored by these events. And you'll see that because Peru is one of them. And it is projected under increasing global change, which is happening to get worse, to become more frequent over the coming years. This is the last big event, 2017. It was called a Coastal El Nino. There's just some data. It was bad. It caught, It lasted for just two months. It cost about 1% of, of Peru's GMP for that year. And then when they reconsidered it with a few, that was immediately afterwards, uh, some months later, they realized it was even more. Oh, so it was more like 1.5% of GMP. Killed people. It displaced almost a million and a half people. Uh, destroyed a lot of infrastructure. So these are bad events. And you'll see what about El Nino makes them so dangerous. We'll get to that. But I'm an archeologist, which means I'm also an anthropologist and I'm concerned about people. In my case, mainly people in the past. But the question that we have to ask is, does climate play a role in human affairs? And as archeologists looking into the past, how can we know? It's not easy because climate, environment, and the world of us, of humans, is very complex. And it's modified by this whole list of things I won't read to you, but they make interpreting even what's happening in the world today very difficult. And from the bits and pieces we get from the past, even more so. What archeologists can do best is to see outcomes. And you'll see some of those here. And then we infer from the outcomes what might've been behind them. So, we, we refer to this study of the relation between humans and their environment now as human ecodynamics. And how can we study those in the past? One is if you work in a marginal region, a small change has a much larger effect. And so it's going to be more visible, not only in the present, but also in the past. The coast of Peru, as we're going to see, is an extreme desert. 
cut by rivers from the Andes. So it is a marginal environment. People can live there only under special circumstances and using special technologies. So a change in conditions can be really significant and cause significant changes for people. And then if you take a marginal region and you apply extreme events like El Nino events to it, they're more visible because they're more extraordinary, they have a greater effect. It's also important to look at not just individual events, but the frequency of events. Are there trends? And we're gonna see all of that as we go forward. And so Peru has these extreme events and mainly they are El Nino. And El Nino's frequency has changed over time. We'll talk about all of that. But first we need to go visit the Peruvian coast. Has anybody actually been there? One person, okay, and two with me. So this white stuff you see here, that it, the, it isn't snow, does anybody know what that is? Guano, yes, you guys are good. You're better than my students. They usually say, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and Peru is a tropical country. It's entirely within the tropics and the equator runs through the very northernmost part of Peru. Oh, there's a map of Peru for concert. So you would think that it would look like this picture here, our typical image of uh, say a Caribbean, tropical Caribbean island. It doesn't because it is one of the world's driest deserts. It's the extension of the Atacama Desert from Chile, almost the entire length of the Peruvian coast. So this white stuff here isn't guano. It also isn't snow, it's sand. This is what it looks like outside of the river valleys. It's extraordinarily dry in normal years. This is an example. This is a giant dune. Uh, one of many is one of the bigger ones. It's so big it has a name. It's called Purpur. And you can see an aerial photo in the upper left, a ground scale photo in the lower lower left. And then just to give you a scale in the picture on the right, I was standing at the bottom of the center looking up and the guy in blue, that was actually Tor Heyerdahl. He was about six feet tall. So it just gives you an idea how big this thing was. And it's also constantly moving because dunes, dunes aren't stable. They keep advancing. And this one actually has advanced over ancient fields and of course made them unusable. So you might ask, if it's this extreme desert, how can people live there? And how could they live there in large numbers and create very complex societies, chiefdoms, and even empires? There are two parts to the answer in terms of resources. The first is that the coast of Peru is a cold coast. It's not warm like you would think. It's not frozen, but it's cold. It's, there's a a current from the Antarctic that washes the shores of Peru all the way up almost to Ecuador. And it causes this great deal of upwelling. The upwelling of the water, deep older water, brings a lot of nutrients. And consequently, Peru is one of the great fishing nations of the world. In the 60s, for a while, they produced, they actually fished more tons of fish than any other nation, which is pretty amazing when you consider it's just the size of California. And at the time probably had 20 million people, maybe even less. And the other, the other part is that there are these rivers that come down from the adjacent Andes Mountains. Water melts from the glaciers. It rains in the highlands. Rivers come down. And if you have irrigation technology, you can draw canals out and you can grow all year round because it is tropical and it never gets colder than about 58 degrees, which isn't, I mean, it's warmer than today here, but it's, it, doesn't, it definitely doesn't freeze. So this is a typical irrigated valley. You can see from one side to the other looking you know, the short way across. And you can see that where the irrigation water no longer reaches, you're back into that stark vegetationless desert. But in the valleys, you can grow very productively season after season. The other thing that happens is that they, on the hills in, in a certain elevation range, in the winter, although it doesn't rain, they get very dense fogs, it's called garua, and there's a set of vegetation that grows from the fog, and you can see them here. They happen to be very lush because they're an El Nino year when they also had some rainfall. But every year there are a small amount of resources people can get from these so-called lomas vegetation things. All right, so what is this El Nino thing I keep talking about? In Spanish, it means the child because it relates, it was identified first as an annual slight warming in Ecuador and northernmost Peru that occurs usually around Christmas time. So it's named for the Christ child. Today, what we call El Nino, the sort of 
the first version identified, turns out there are many different versions or flavors, but the most important one, the first identified is now called the Eastern Pacific El Nino. And it happens when the coast of Peru and all the way up into California, the coast of the West Coast of the Americas warms up. Normally it's cool water, as I said. That in turn causes well, torrential rainfall. This happens in, in part, it's associated with a change in pressure between the Eastern and Western Pacific, the Southern Oscillation. So have anybody heard the term ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation? That's where it comes from. But I'm gonna to refer to El Nino, that's what happens the, on the Peruvian side, mostly. So just to show you, this is what it looks like. The, the redder it is, the, the warmer it is compared to normal conditions. You can see that it is this incredible warming across the center of the Pacific and down along the coast of Peru and a bit up in, as I said, into California as well. Is that the water temperature? Yes, that's a water temperature anomaly. So the, the redder it is, the more different it is from average conditions the, and the warmer. And the blue ones are the where it's colder than normal. There are other flavors of El Nino, I'll tell you very briefly. La Nina, when it becomes unusually cool, that has some negative connotations, but not so bad. Fishing is really good. Oh. There's something called El Nino Modoque or Central Pacific El Nino, where the center of the Pacific warms as it does at the beginning of a regular El Nino event, but it doesn't reach all the way to the coast of Peru. It does have another effect that I'll show, I think, in the, yes, in this slide, or I won't show it, but I'll tell you about it. You can see that it doesn't warm on the coast of Peru. It warms in Central Pacific, but it does change the wind patterns so that the highlands of Peru no longer get rainfall during those events. And since all the water that comes to Peru comes from the highlands, the rivers cut down to 50% of their normal discharge. And if you are making your living from irrigation off of those rivers, that is significant and only recently recognized in the last 15 years. And there's another one called Costal Nino, but that really, where we do most of our work, looks just the same as the other kind, the regular original kind of El Nino. It just lasts less, less time. So what does it do? The first thing is it, decreases the amount of things living in the ocean and associated with the ocean along the coast of Peru. So fewer fish, fewer shellfish, fewer uh, sea mammals, less algae, a lot of other things, less seabirds. So a lot of the resources people depend on have a significant downturn. There's a bit of replacement with warmer water species, but there's overall a very large loss in biomass. This cartoon as the Geologist called this schematic shows you on the left a normal year and all the things that live there beginning with the plankton on up to all the big animals and then how much fewer there are during El Nino. Hmm. This, is what this is what happens in different kinds of events to stream flow on the North Coast. The green is a normal year. Peak flow is always in the austral summer, so January, February, March. But you can see that in the blue, an El Nino, a regular El Nino year, it goes way up, and that's all rainfall on the coast, which is very destructive. And the bottom, the red line, is what happens during these uh, Central Pacific El Ninos when it's cut in half. Flooding. So when you get all that torrential rainfall in one of the regular or coastal El Nino events, it causes significant flooding. And remember, this is a largely unvegetated coast. There is nothing to hold the sediment back so the, or the water back. So it really floods. Like you heard about that with the White Mountains and no trees. Imagine that there are no trees here at all and there never are. So when it gets torrential rainfall in the coastal zone, it's really significant. This is up in the northern part of Peru where they have oil wells. That is a wellhead. And before the last several El Nino events, before 1982, that was at the surface. That's how much got stripped by the last couple of events. Yeah. There's a bridge in Ecuador after just one event in 1982-83. Oh, these are very destructive events. And I don't have a picture of an actual insect. This is a crust, this is a scorpion which walked into our, or crawled into our pit one day. It's actually dead in this picture, but one of my workmen killed it so well that it looked alive. But this is to remind me that another thing that happens when it rains is you get a lot of standing water. So you get a great deal more insects like mosquitoes and then you get epidemics of mosquito-borne diseases. In the last couple of events, it's been malaria, chikungunya, Zika, and dengue, none of which are nice. 
it's very bad for the agriculture. This is a description from a Spanish priest of the first big El Nino event after the Spanish conquest. So the conquest began in 1532. This is 1578, recorded in 1580 by a scribe, and you can read it. It's pretty scary. If you've got piles of dead mice the size of rats or medium rabbits in the middle of your fields and nothing left in the fields, that is not a good thing. And if everything rots, that's not a good thing. It's not all bad. This is the bit of hope. There, there are some replacements. There are some opportunities that come with these events. So we'll take a look. On the central coast of Peru, as fish are escaping from the El Nino events, they swim on shore. And if you know what to do with them, this is an unearned resource. If you know how to process them quickly, you can gather these fish very easily in huge quantities, dry them, and then have a resource to get you through the lean times that come with El Nino, if you know. Uh, people today largely don't know. Sometimes fish jump out on shore for other reasons. That happened in a village in the valley I lived in for three years when I was working with Hiredal. Everybody thought it actually happened. It was the village of St. Joseph, San Jose. Everybody thought it was a miracle. 700 metric tons of fish just jumped out on the shore and they were mostly edible. And people feasted and they thought it was great for about a day and a half. And then the fish began to rot. It became a public health hazard and the government had to send in bulldozers to plow them under the sand. Oh, you have to know what to do. Another, how many of you like scallops? They have scallops along the coast of Peru. They fish them all the time, but there's modest quantity. During El Nino events, these things boom. The change in oxygen at the, at the bay floor where they live and the reduction of predators because a lot of the big animals are gone because of things like sea lions that eat them because of the events, cause an incredible boom. And they're, they're just, are you, in 83, you could buy a dozen scallops for about five cents in the market because they were just, and they're giant piles of, of shells that look like archeological piles, but they're from 1983 because they were processing them and canning them and selling them around the world because it was one of these great resources that just during these events. And this happened in the past. These are scallop shell middens that actually are not modern ones, but ancient ones that people created as much as, oh, what would that be, almost 4,000 years ago uh, along the coast, where they're like 32 with all of those little numbers in the chart. Those are um, scallop shell middens. And they're pretty much nothing but charcoal on scallop shells. They were probably drying them. You can capture some of the flood water where it's not flowing so heavily and then use that for alternative agriculture. There's, a, I don't know if you can make it out, but there is a, a long oh, canal here that captured water. You can see part of this canal. This is a thousand year old structure built by ancient Peruvians. It's this thing. And this is just the beginning. It goes on for several more miles. It acts as a dam. You can see some, well, this is actually just runoff from irrigation. It's not an El Nino year. In El Nino years, it gets more. And this is, these are all edible plants that were planted behind a, a small gully protected by the, this, um, this long, long canal. And uh, not a dam, but it's a canal. And uh, it didn't get breached. So water accumulated and they grew this entire very successful crop. It wasn't nearly as much as the area that was lost to the destruction from the, from the rainfall and the flooding, but at least they got something back here. And this is a paper, I won't go into great detail, this is a technical paper, but one archaeologist discovered that in one of the valleys, ancient people beginning about 1500 years ago, started building structures to capture the water from the side gullies of the valley during El Nino events, when the big fields were, and the big canals were destroyed, they could start planting on this other surface. There are ways of slowing the water down, capturing the silt, making sure the water was distributed at a rate that would not destroy the growing crops. Oh, it's incredibly sophisticated. This is one of those technologies that has been lost, but can be recovered. It was developed over millennia by people living on this landscape and being familiar with these kinds of events and what to do about them. The desert blooms. I mentioned these lomas, these plants that grow from the fog every year, but during the El Nino events, there's that picture again, they grow extraordinarily, and some of them have edible tubers. There's firewood. They're actually trees in some places. So that's another resource. Um, and another, this is another view of that. But another thing that happens is that when you have El Nino events and it's raining on the coast, 
in the southern highlands around Lake Titicaca, which is up between Peru and Bolivia, that's an area where people in the past and today herd very large numbers of animals. In the past, it was llamas and alpacas, sort of like the things on my tie. But they have a drought during most El Nino events, and the pasturage goes down. So what do they do? They bring their animals down to the coast. They're still doing it today. They're European animals, cows and, and uh, horses and sheep and goats. They bring them down to eat this extraordinary growth. It doesn't save all of them, but it saves a lot of them. Again, if you understand the environment and where things are and how they change in these events, there are things you can do to mitigate some of the negative consequences. When you have these floods, it's like the Nile. How many are familiar with how the Nile Valley works in ancient Egypt, that it floods every year, it puts the rich silt on the land, they don't have to go into fallow, they don't have to fertilize. Same thing happens with these El Nino events. It erodes topsoil from further up the valleys. The floods go out and slow down and drop that silt on top of the fields and it replenishes the fertility of the fields. There are some trees that live in the desert. They are intimately related with El Nino events. They're called agarrobos. You can see some here. You might wonder, how can a tree grow in the desert? Well, the way that these grow is that when you get standing water during El Nino, the seeds germinate and they shoot their tap roots down really quickly till they reach groundwater while there's still surface water. After the surface water dries up, the trees can continue to grow from the groundwater that they're getting from their tap roots. Oh, this isn't, there, there's a long explanation, but that just, a scientific study to show that this really happens, that the El Nino is important to the cycle of these trees. One Italian geographer who spent a lot of time in Peru in the 1800s wrote about finding that the forest of these trees had modular sizes, a bunch at this size, a bunch at this size, a bunch at this size, because it, they only start growing during El Nino events. And then they go for a bunch of years, no El Nino, no new trees. Oh, anyway, and they have edible pods. They're a legume. Oh, they grind them up. They, they, you can make drinks and other things. You can feed them to animals. Oh. For a while, somebody was trying to make fake coffee. They called it no es cafe. Not, it's not coffee. I, I bought some once. I, try, I have to say I was not really enamored of it. I, I like real coffee. Oh. But they tried. And yeah, going the wrong way. There we go. Well, another thing is that when these floods occur, of course, they do deposit sediment, eventually they build up some parts of the landscape above the thousand year flood. And it turns out that around 400 AD, we know of two sites so far where a culture called the Moche, who were in the first millennium AD in North Coast, where they were very, very well known among archeologists, beautiful pottery, very complex society. They started building big sites on top of this landscape after the landscape was above the floods. So they took advantage of landscape construction to create complex safe sites. And so the, what you see above preoccupational surface, that's all the deposits that went from 400 AD to about the time of the conquest. Below that is all the natural sediment accumulated by El Nino floods before that. And this is a place where the, only, the river only flows during El Nino events because it doesn't go high enough in the mountains. So it is the only way that this landscape was built. And this is um, just a look at the flood deposits. This is another site uh, called the Temple of the Sun and the Moon. This is the Temple of the Sun. Uh, we didn't got the chance to dig on the backside of that, on the valley side, and we found the same thing. We had all these flood deposits, and then as you can see on the right, on top of it, when it reached high enough that it was safe, then they started building this humongous construction. It's just go back this this thing is calculated to have involved 143 million adobe bricks when it was intact. Uh, much of it was destroyed by the Spaniards who did hydraulic mining for gold, but that's a whole other story. And then finally, crisis management. You remember uh, perhaps Rahm Emanuel, who was Obama's first chief of staff, who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And although it's not something we can prove about the past, I have long believed from a variety of lines of evidence that after a hiatus in El Nino that we'll talk about, when it came back, we start to see the first really large temples being built. Somebody had to gather the labor force and convince people to make this. I think that probably religious entrepreneurs were saying, look, do this, help me, help us interface with the gods to stop these events and they won't come back. And for several thousand years, they only came back about once or twice a century 
when they suddenly, and we'll get to the story again later, but when they suddenly came back every five or 10 years, they just boom, stopped building those temples. We'll see that. So I suspect this is what happened. So what do we know? The, there's a downside and all these things that I've talked about, and there's an upside. The upside is not as much as the downside, but it's a whole lot better than doing nothing or having no way to get through these events. And the long-term story is despite these recurring events, populations on the coast continued over the long-term, they were growing up until the one really great demographic disaster, which is the Spanish conquest. Uh, when population went down in places from every 100 people down to one in 85 years. Uh, between disease, misuse, mismanagement, uh, not listening to what people knew about how to survive El Nino events, uh, turned out in 1578, they put all the new villages in the wrong places. Uh, but there are things that you can do that make them less bad. So if we want to study El Nino and its effect on cultural development in the past, we have to have a record of it. And we have to perhaps, we would like to be able to associate it directly with archeological sites where we know what people were doing or we know something about what they were doing. It turns out that the standard ways you get a climate record for anywhere don't really work on the coast of Peru. What we have instead are 13,000 years of archeological deposits. So here are some of the standard ways. You can take a core from a glacier or, or an ice cap on top of a mountain. And you can actually look at it year by year, and then later maybe in packets of years, you can study what's happening to climate in that area and where the wind comes from. Uh, we have people at the University of Maine who are world leaders in doing this kind of research. Um, but the only glaciers are on the east side of the Andes. They're affected at least as much by Atlantic climate as Pacific climate. So they're not a really great proxy or really great way to understand climate in the area we're interested in down on the coast. So that doesn't really work. Corals are pretty good. They grow seasonally and you can take a core of a coral and you can study it level by level and look at climate. They're floating. You have to date the top and the bottom by some radiometric means, but you can get them more or less in place and then you can get a floating chronology of climate, but it's a cold water coast. There are no corals. Lake cores are not as, oh, usually don't have annual levels except if you're next to a glacier, but they do have you know, packets of views. You can get a time sequence. They develop, they uh, accumulate through time. So you think, all right, a lake core would be good. Remember, it's a desert. This is why we need the archeological deposits, except there is one sort of lake that we might talk about. But here are our archeological deposits. And this will give you that this site goes back to about 13,000 years. It's in Southern Peru. It's where fish, fishing people live. Those blue things, although we're in Maine, they are not blueberries, they're blue balloons to show which post holes where posts have been placed 13,000 years ago, uh, go from the same time period. All the way up to the time of the conquest, this site was occupied from about, and built from about 1100 AD to about 1540, just after the conquest when it was abandoned. It's a site called Tucume. This is the place where I worked with Torhailo for many years. So we have a lot of tools to identify the climate and El Nino events that come from coastal deposits, many associated with archeological sites. This is a senior colleague. You can see he's found evidence of El Nino there. He's pointing to it. Remember El Nino is the child, right? <laughs> so there it is. I, that was a list of the things, but that's more technical than we need to get. There's more evidence of El Nino, by the way. We found this on the coast of Peru in 2006 on one of the beaches that we were looking at. Oh, and I like I like this slide, but let's take a look now in the remaining minutes at some of the things in ancient Peru. So I'm going to start with a case study about burning and abandonment and the relationship to El Nino. So we're going to a valley called Lambayeque, which you see in this air photo here, this Google Earth photo. There were three major large scale civilizations that were there. The first was called the Moche. I talked about them earlier. Their northern outpost was in this valley. And they had a, a large center called Pampa Grande. This is the biggest mound at Pampa Grande you see here. Those are the years. It wasn't super long lived, about 150 years, 600 to 750 AD or CE. And then it was abandoned. At the time it was abandoned, the temple on top of this mound was burned. People then moved to the focus of construction to a nearby area called Batan Grande. And for about 350 years, they built a lot of really big mounds. At the end of that time, 
they burned the temples and they moved to the site of Tucumán, which we've already seen. And they were there until the Spanish conquest. So the question that we asked, actually originally asked by a BBC reporter who was doing a, a movie about Tucumán, did El Nino have something to do with these abandonments? So we thought we would look into that and we put together this sequence. So bottom and top, all the dotty things are climate records that relate to El Nino. And the middle are the, the uh, colored lines are the approximate time of abandonment of these sites. So the first one, Pampa Grande, seems to have been abandoned just at or at the end of a peak of El Nino. So that could be El Nino. Oops, I want to stay there. Uh, the second one, the purple line, there's a little, there's a little peak, but not much is going on. So is it El Nino? Probably not. Could climate be pushing things when other things were perhaps difficult? Maybe. Oh, I still didn't remember. So the green one, I keep thinking I have things moving across here. There's absolutely nothing special going on here, but we know what this is. This is the Spanish conquest. So it's important to know that although climate can be an important driver of changes, it's not the only one. And it's not always the right answer. We have to study to be sure what is the right answer. And so here we have a case where almost certainly it is, a case where it might be, and a case where it definitely isn't. That's sort of like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? All right. So we'll look at some case studies of collapse. Oh, related. This is the ending of civilizations or the change in them, at least, related to El Nino. So as I mentioned, about 5,800 years ago, El Nino returns after having been absent for several thousand years, something that we discovered originally by accident, as I mentioned, back in my early years in Peru, and we've worked on for a long time. Oh, when it comes back, this is when they start to build these big mounds. This is one there, oh, I don't know, you probably can't see, but there's actually a human on top of that thing. Oh, this is big, it's 250 meters long, 150 meters wide, 15 to 17 meters high. And it dates back over 5,000 years. There were a lot of mounds built at that time. Well, this is, shows where a bunch of them were. Here are some more, this is a, one of the early ones, smaller. This is the one we were just looking at from the air. Oh yeah, there's the person, you, know, you can't make out. Joe Kelly from South Portland. This is one of the biggest, just a couple of the three of the big mounds is actually taken from the biggest mound and you can see the dates. Another, another one near Lima. These are really cool sites and they're big. And this is before people had pottery even. So they'd already developed complex societies without, they had, they turns out had agriculture, but they were getting a lot of their food from the ocean because there were very few destructions from El Nino that worked pretty well. Oh. So we do see in the middle of it, at the site of Corral and that, that area where the most sites were, they were abandoned before, the, before El Nino became more frequent. And to understand that, we had to look at what we call the sediment cycle, which starts with earthquakes, which are common. This is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire a subducting plate, so you get big earthquakes. This is one I missed by about 12 hours, thank goodness. Oh, they, that creates a lot of debris, like you see here. And remember, unvegetated, so nothing to hold it in place. When you get the rain, it washes all that down into the river. It washes it out to, out to the shore. And then some of it, the fine stuff, blows in the sand dunes. There are some of my colleagues resting on some of those dunes. And you can see these big dune trains here, right? That's a lot of sand. Well, think about that if you have agricultural fields. I kind of previewed that with that giant dune poor poor earlier. This is a, a schematic where the black dash lines with the little triangles, that's the flood water bringing the sediment down. The number two with that white arrow is the sediment moving along the coast, creating a beach ridge, but also blowing sand in off of that. And that's the threes, the arrows with the threes. You can see some of the sand still here. If that goes over your fields, at least for a while, your fields aren't going to work because you can't grow in sand. All the soil's covered. Oh, and it's this that correlates with the abandonment of those particular sites. They had enough El Nino events that this ridge built log big enough to generate the sand that got rid of it. So it's related to El Nino, but it's not directly the El Nino destruction. It's a secondary effect here while well, things get complex. And these are just some of our evidence. We actually had evidence of earthquakes right before these abandonments. Uh, you can see the cracks in an earlier uh, staircase, maybe. You can see those walls. They look like they're at an angle. They are. They actually got shifted like this by a big earthquake. In each case, there was one final construction 
as the sand was moving in and then boom. So that produced a lot of sand. There's some of the sand on top of a floor at one of the sites. Uh, the earthquake produced the debris, the debris went down, came back as a ridge, blew inland, and then the sites are abandoned. And they're abandoned from south to north. That's the direction the wind blows. And that's the direction the sediment moves along the shore, creating the ridge that is the source of the sand. So it all kind of makes sense. There were two sites that were outside of this region that continued later. Oh, one is called Salinas de Chao, the other is El Paraíso. And I think that Again, something we can't yet prove, but I suspect that there were climate disaster migrants, refugees, who left this central area, which was highly populated, and went north and south, and perhaps contributed labor in exchange for being able, able to live where these other sites were. Interestingly, these are the two sites that keep a lifeway without pottery when everybody else around them is using pottery. They were very conservative, and it may be because the center of that pre-pottery civilization, those people may have moved up there to get away from the loss of agricultural growing conditions in their homeland. Can't prove that. There were still, however, temples being built outside of that one area that was impacted by the secondary effect. El Nino is still infrequent. This is one, one of the sites. Here's another one. I'll... There used to be a store in the main mall in Portland that was called Ethnics or something. And they sold Indian clothes and, uh, you know, saris and, and all incense and all these other things. And they had copies of these carvings reproduced on the, uh, at the entrance. We went in once, we, my wife and I happened to pass there in like 94 or so. And when we saw it, I said, wow, I went to talk to the, uh, to the young woman at the counter. And we said, you, you know, these are from a site called Seixin. So I said, Gene, and first, yeah, yeah, I heard that. I said, Do you know what they are? I said, yeah, they're like cool ancient drawings. I said, well, these, this is a flag. This is a warrior. And these are body parts. All, it's basically two processions of warriors led by flags, leading processions of body parts. Vertebrae, severed heads, cut off arms. There are intestines, stomachs, eyeballs. I mean, you could, it goes on and on. Oh, she was horrified. And the next time we went back, the store had closed. Not saying there's any relation. This mound is near the airport in Lima. It's so big, they thought it was a natural hill and put a power tower on it. But inside it, when it was excavated, had all sorts of really cool art. It was a very important site, um, sadly much destroyed. So the frequency of El Nino increased, we would say now about 900 BC, 900 to 1000 BC. And very interestingly, this is when the temple stopped being built. But of course, is there a relation? As always, the devil's in the details. There's the devil. And these are my colleagues in some of this work. And to get at whether this is exact, the, the time when they stop building these mounds after almost 3,000 years, and they don't build big mounds for about 600 years, not depopulated. There's still people, there's still complex sites, we'll see. But they stop building these mounds. Well, we got some evidence from the one thing that is like a lake in northern Peru, when El Nino happens, the Satura Desert, right, which you see here, all that, all that blue is the water that fills in from the El Nino runoff. And there's an ephemeral lake that lasts for a couple of years. At one point, the president of Peru stocked it with fish, and then there were like lots of dead fish when it dried up. But it occurred to us that there, this must have happened in the past, not the fish, but, this, but the lakes, and that there would be sediment reflecting it. So we took some cores. We found out that was true. There's one of my colleagues, very happy because we recovered these cores. How he got them back to the States, I don't know. You can see those things that look like pipe bombs, right? Those are the cores, have to be kept intact. He took them back with him about a week after the shoe bomber when they suddenly decided you couldn't take anything bigger than this with liquid in it. And so, I, I don't know, there he is, amazing. He's at Paul Smith's College uh, in the Adirondacks. Anyway, well, and, and we studied them and we dated them. And this is technicals of the dating, but basically we could see that they started to accumulate El Nino related sediments frequently at about 2,900 years ago. This is when the, the temples on the north and central coast of Peru are abandoned. In the adjacent highlands, it's the most significant cultural change. Got that from archeologists who work up there. And pottery from this north coast area suddenly appears 1,500 kilometers to the south for the first time. 
as though people are being forced to move around. Well, if you start to have El Nino events every five to 10 years, it's gonna have a significant influence on your life, particularly until you learn how to adjust. It's not long after that, they start building those special field systems to take advantage of the water. It suddenly became useful and, and economically useful enough because it occurred enough to be worth investing in doing that. And this is one of the sites we have evidence for, a colleague of mine who's now at Tulane. Uh, what you see here is a wall and a floor of one of these mounds that was abandoned when El Nino became more frequent. That's all water laid sediment. This is the moment of abandonment. Oh, and we have dates. He had some events of El Nino uh, before construction there. Then he had three events while they were using it. If you take the average, it's like the 100 years we said that before 900 BC, it was about every 100 years, and then it became more frequent. And the termination is exactly when we see that change in the Satura Desert. And we can ignore that. As I said, they didn't, people didn't all die and go away, but they lived, they had a different style. This is what sites began to look like. No mounds, big complex sites, lots of people, but they were, they, if the mounds were temples meant to keep El Nino away, this is part of my argument for that, they clearly weren't working anymore. It could have been a crisis of faith. And so they started doing something different. And this is what the different looks like. Probably somewhat fewer people, but eventually, as I said, they grew back. They did manage to mitigate these effects, to build systems of, of uh, agriculture and so on that allowed them to keep moving forward. Probably figured out how to dry fish more effectively than they do now anyway. So uh, I already mentioned that. Final, final two slides. Um, it's, it's always interesting. I'm, I'm an archeologist, I love the past. I love learning about the past. But as scholars, we also wanna think about what this might mean for the future. Is there any utility in doing this work beyond the academic interest of knowing what was happening? So these are a bunch of kids in 1997 when they predicted a big El Nino event that came to pass. And they were trying to get their parents to pay attention and prepare for it, because if you get ready for it in advance, you can uh, weather the effects a lot more. And so that first sign says, careful, there's a naughty child coming. <laughs> and the one in the back says, prevent instead of lament. Oh. And their, their teachers helped organize and they're doing that. And they did more that time because they finally had a good prediction six months in advance. It was bad, but a lot of things were not as bad as they would have been because they knew it was coming. There's some evidence that traditional societies have ways of knowing when it's going to come. Observations of some of the stars and when you can't see them because the oh, atmosphere over the central Pacific is changing, things like that. So what can we get from this? Well, one thing is that we get unique data. Remember, there aren't a lot of climate records relevant to the coast of Peru, which is the heartland of El Nino. And we can, they can be used to refine models that climatologists make to predict future climate. The way they test those models is against past data. Otherwise, they don't know if they're going to work or not. They have to account for past data. The more data you have from more parts of the world, the better refined the models can be. And so we are contributing data to that effort. We can learn how earlier people faced the stresses of El Nino. What kinds of mitigations did they have after living there for millennia that they developed by trial and error that worked or that worked to some degree, like making those field systems, check dams to keep the debris flows from destroying sites. We found those recently. We're going back next summer to study some of them, in fact. So there are probably other technologies to be discovered. Oh, technologies that can be implemented by local communities with no machinery, no cost, just labor. And we can see medium uh, and long-term processes that are not obvious in the short term, like this sediment cycle that I showed you. It's one of the reasons I showed you. That hasn't stopped, that still happens. You still have El Nino, floods, debris, sand coming in. It's gonna happen again. The more often El Nino happens, the more likely it's gonna happen, particularly if it comes after a big earthquake. So knowing that can allow uh, mitigations to be put in place as well. And it does show, I, I think, that loss of faith can lead to regime change. <laughs> All right, there's my evidence for El Nino and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.